to show that <clears throat> if any one of these is taken out of its position so that it is not properly related to the others, there can only be confusion. But God is not the author of confusion. And the better we get to know his book and understand the form of doctrine and understand that this is sound doctrine <clears throat> and that these topics put together are called the truth, then we can be strong and then we will not be shaken. But there is a warning, is there not? That the time will come when they will not endure <clears throat> sound doctrine but will heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. They want to be entertained rather than taught. That's a horrible thing to have happen in the church <clears throat> where Bible teaching has been featured and where the purposes of God have been emphasized. It's a terrible thing to have happen, to have people become bored and dissatisfied because their ears are not being tickled because they're just getting the truth. Well, it happened in Ephesus. There's no question about that. It happened in Ephesus, not very long after Paul had gone home to be with the Lord. But as you and I think of the times in which we live and recognize the prophetic, the prophetic aspect of Paul's words when the time will come, not may come, but will come. We have witnessed this during, certainly during my time as a minister, where at one time the word was taught. There was sound doctrine. There was a form of doctrine. Dispensational truth. It, all, it just all dovetailed. And people were being given this. But then something happened. And they wouldn't endure that anymore. They wanted something that was more entertaining or ear tickling and they turned their ears away. And there are many, many organizations that once, in still in existence, that once were churches, but the light has been removed. With that in mind, let us consider the tremendous responsibility that rests upon us to maintain sound doctrine. Not, to, not merely to subscribe to it, but to live in it. Live in it and practice it and apply it. I remember being quite uh, evangelistic, if I may put it that way, because uh, in the early days of the, of the ministry, uh, because there were so many that were unsaved. And, and they needed to hear the way of salvation. And there were believers who could give you the time and the place and the event when they were saved, but they didn't have assurance. And so the way of salvation was given uh, uh, quite frequently, as well as other teaching. But as time went on, it became necessary to do more teaching <clears throat> and then presenting the way of salvation uh, together with it as time went on. And we discovered this, that where God touched lives and caused them to be interested in what does the Bible say? I want to go to a church where they teach the Bible. And they began to see that God's people were eating the word of God, were feasting on the word of God, were really thrilled by learning from the word of God. We found that a number of these people came under conviction of sin. And their heart cried out, what must I do to be saved? And what a privilege it was to lead them to the Lord. You see, every service does not have to be an evangelistic service, but every service should be one in which the life of God is made evident in the personality of the believers present. Then, as unsaved come in, they come under conviction of sin. They realize that we have something that they do not have. 
and they begin to ask, what must I do to be saved? Don't be afraid of sound doctrine. Sometimes these studies seem heavy. Sometimes they seem challenging to the mind. Indeed, they are. But stay with it because it's the only fortress, it's the only safe place to be in the age of confusion in which we live. Then don't be discouraged and downhearted <clears throat> when you find, as I have found down through the years, that someone will not endure sound doctrine. 